Hi, my name is Duration. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii show, Finding Our Future. And we are here every other Tuesday from 1 to 1.30. And we cover issues from sustainability to social justice, things that matter for our future, um, and especially for young people and millennials. So today I'm really stoked that um, my guest is Christine Ahn. And she is the founder and executive director of Women Cross DMZ. And Christine, thank you for being here. Oh, thank you, Duray. I'm honored. Um, so it would be great for people just to get an overview um, of exactly what you do on a regular daily basis. Well, I kind of do a little bit of this. I do a lot of talking on conference calls with people from around the world especially Washington, D.C. and New York. Um, I write a bunch of articles and primarily our goal is we want to see an end to the Korean War. And people often say the Korean War, that was like 70 years ago. And didn't that war end? And yes, it ended with a ceasefire, but it did not formally end with a peace settlement. And so we have been mobilizing women around the world to call for an end to the Korean War with a peace agreement and to mobilize women to ensure that our voices and our perspectives are included in this peace process. And so that's what we've been doing. And in 2015, I helped organize a historic peace walk of women, 30 women peacemakers from around the world, many from the countries that participated in the Korean War um, walked with 10,000 Korean women on both sides of the DMZ. And that was um, a historic event. It really, I believe, transformed um, the peace and social movements in South Korea and uh, really set forth, I think, a, an incredible um, change, I think, in the conversation, um, not just on the Korean Peninsula, but especially here in the United States where most Americans have no clue about the Korean War. They have no idea that the United States divided the Korean Peninsula, um, that uh, more bombs were dropped on the Korean Peninsula than all of the Asia Pacific theater during World War II, that the US is the one that um, began the nuclear crisis. We threatened to use atomic weapons during the Korean War, and we have placed uh, nuclear weapons in South Korea up until George Bush Sr. And so um, it's been really important to educate. And that's why I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be on your show today, because um, it was the Korean War that actually inaugurated the military industrial complex. It's a it quadrupled defense spending in this country. It set forth the US to become the world's military police. And I think that we have a huge opportunity right now to end the longest standing overseas US conflict and um, hopefully begin the process of building a more just and uh, diplomatic and peaceful U.S. foreign policy. Yeah, I have so many questions about this because um, I'm Korean too, I'm Korean American. And so this, you know, this issue is very like important to me just for like my family and my culture. And so um, what my first question is, why women? Why is this a woman-led movement and why is that important? Well, it's, um, I, I get this question oftentimes and I, every time I have like a different response, but at this very moment, first of all, the, the data is in and there have been numerous studies that track conflicts around the world and that it has actually shown that uh, when women are involved in peace processes, it actually leads to a peace agreement. Mm -hmm. And there have been now nine UN Security Council resolutions uh, mandating that women are involved in peace processes. And, you know, it's like even the Trump administration, Donald Trump even signed something called the um, Women, Peace and Security Act mandating women's inclusion in the peace process. So um, the, the international law is in place, the data is in, but it's really been my experience in the last five years since organizing the historic crossing of the DMZ to witness the role of women and how women tend to organize differently. And um, it's been, I think, especially for um, some of the grassroots 
um, network. So there is now 10 chapters across the country of Korea Peace Now, which is the transnational feminist campaign that we launched. But, you know, historically in this country, a lot of the Korean Americans that have done this peace work have been men. They have been older men. And I think that there is a different way of organizing. And now it's been an opportunity saying that it's, you know, it's not like we're saying men aren't allowed or gender non-conforming people aren't allowed, but it is definitely a movement that is led by women. And it's not just about um, our gender, but it's about um, the kind of values, the feminist values that we bring to this peace building work that is inclusive, that is non-hierarchical, that is really um, challenging militarism, that is intersectional. And so um, that's, for me, the amazing thing, because, you know, when I set out to do this, I really used a lot of the language around the UN Security Council resolution. The most significant one is 1325. It was passed in 2000. Hillary Clinton was a real champion of it. And it really, you know, called for women's inclusion and peace processes. But it's been so fascinating to actually be experiencing it and to actually see how women through, um, we don't obviously have a seat at the table, but it doesn't mean that we don't influence the discourse. And it doesn't mean that we don't change the political space for there to be uh, a shift in the conversation. So because of our organizing, because of our persistence, because of our networking, and um, I mean, outright, um, I don't know, it's just like, you're not gonna get rid of us. And so we're just gonna keep knocking on the door. We're gonna keep demanding a seat at the table. And we're gonna be putting forth um, really a critical version, a critical history, a critical analysis that uh, I think is trying to get to the root cause of this problem and to build power uh, horizontally and to build movements and to um, really democratize US foreign policy. I think that, um, it's been just a, a transformative thing to not just witness that the, some of the shifts in conversation, I would say for sure there have been two things that Women Cross TMZ, I, I believe we can own. And one is that um, the conversation about denuclearization has shifted. We have said that peace needs to go alongside denuclearization. We can't just assume that North Korea is gonna hand over their nuclear weapons without a security guarantee. And that must come in the form of a peace agreement. And so that has actually gained some traction. And so in fact, when you see the presidential um, candidates uh, among the Democrats, they are no longer saying the you know CVID, the complete verifiable irreversible dismantlement of North Korea's nuclear weapons. They're actually saying now it needs to be a step-by-step -step approach. So that's one. I do feel like we have really shifted the conversation nationally about that issue. But the second one is about human rights. I mean, you know, when we were doing this peace walk in 2015, we got like hammered for not caring about North Korea human rights. Oh, that evil regime, how could you engage with them? And we have said that peace is actually the path to improving human rights in North Korea. And amazingly enough, in the last few weeks, the UN Special Rapporteur on North Korea human rights, his name is Thomas Quintana, he actually made a statement saying that the United States should negotiate a peace agreement separate from a denuclearization deal because that will improve human rights in North Korea. So it has been um, remarkable to see how women organizers, activists, experts, strategists, when we work together, we can actually um, create the political space and the momentum to achieve a peace agreement. Yeah. One question I have is, what, what is the benefit of officially ending the Korean War? Because it has been so long. I bet this is a question you guys get a lot. And what is the risk of not ending it like so why like why is that a primary goal like does it really do anything in the physical world yes absolutely so um in 1953 so the korean war was from 1950 to 53 and four million people were killed and they finally the commanders negotiated an armistice agreement it actually took over a year to sign that agreement but it was a ceasefire they agreed to stop halt fighting but they promised within that provision to return within 90 days to negotiate a political settlement. And so because they have not done that, 
North Korea and the United States is still in a state of war, as is South Korea. Um, but uh, so that means that um, there is uh, a state of war that exists. That means that at any point, just as Hawaii experienced in 2018, when um, the false missile alert uh, that was supposedly coming from North Korea, that means that the United States with South Korea regularly conducts military exercises, practicing regime change. So what happened right now recently with the US assassination of um, the general in Iran, Soleimani, that is what they practice. Uh, on an annual basis, you know, is um, to strike and take out uh, the North Korean leadership. Mm -hmm. And so at the same time, what you see is North Korea. They're also conducting missile tests, nuclear weapons tests. This is insanity. Yeah. And um, just even at that level, that is not okay. But I, I think the other perspective that women bring is what about the families? Mm -hmm. Millions of families still remain separated by the world's militarized border, the DMZ. And without peace, there is not an opportunity for either the families to reunite, or frankly, even the Korean people to be able to travel freely across the Korean peninsula. I think that 70 years of war has really closed off um, our creativity, our imagination of what is possible. And I think that's why we do what we do, the kind of bold, direct action, and um, thinking outside of the box. And that is why it's so powerful for women to do this work because we are outside the, um, the halls of power. And I think because um, we don't use brute force, we don't depend on our masculinity to um, push things forward, that we use our ingenuity and our relationships um, and trust building to achieve things that um, that we, you know, we will have a much more sustainable and holistic peace. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like ending the Korean War is um, more of like a foundational thing. Like it allows space to have these other conversations to move to the next steps that are needed to create yeah. like a more. Yeah. Totally. Well, I mean, if the U.S. negotiates a peace agreement with North Korea, then North Korea is that sets forth a process of normalizing relationships. And so that means that they don't have to have this militarized confrontational a, a relationship. Yeah. It means that um, the U.S. policy of maximum pressure, which includes sanctions against ordinary people, it means that actually North Korea could join the international economy. It means that North Korea, 40 percent of North Koreans don't need to be on the verge of hunger, it means that, um, you know, the democratization of the Korean Peninsula, which also includes not just North Korea, but South Korea, I means like people often, um, you know, slam North Korea for the human rights violations. But look at our country. I mean, you might be too young, Duray, but after 9 11, you know, we passed something in this country called the Patriot Act, yeah. and we allow system wide surveillance of everybody in this country and you know the targeting of um, political opposition in this country it's like we think we live in such a free democracy but you know it's like and so when we allow the governments um, to say that there is the threat of war the threat of our security that enables governments to use repression to justify freedom freedom of speech freedom of assembly and so i i really um, work hard to educate Americans that, um, you know, Korea is facing this uh, kind of arrested development because the unresolved Korean War. Yeah. Yeah. I have this, um, I have this debate with my partner and many people who are proud Americans and they want to just defend what America is doing and, and criticize other countries and be like, you know, North Korea is you know, they're doing all the sketchy things. Like, it's very vague. It's like they don't understand what's happening. On, I'm not defending any country, but I think to your point, like, look at what's happening here. P supposedly the best country on earth in some measures or to some subjective um, perspectives. But there are all of these injustices going on here as well. And so I guess my question to you is, what? how would you explain to, like, folks who are very defensive about American foreign, po foreign policy like what why north korea is so anti-america and like what was 
like, what was the U.S.'s part in the Korean War, and why is there this animosity to the United States for people who don't really know that history and context? Thank you. Um, I think that that is so vital to have that critical historical perspective. And so in 1945, at the end of World War II, when um, the United States defeated, and I want to say defeated in quotes because we dropped two nuclear weapons on Nagasaki and Hiroshima and annihilated instantly a quarter million people in Japan, which included actually hundreds of thousands of, um, or tens of thousands of Koreans because Japan had colonized Korea for 35 years. And so my parents were born in the 1920s and they, like every other Korean, poured out into the streets in 1945 because they had, um, they felt that Korean liberation was finally here. But instead of independence, what Korea and Koreans got was division. Two you young U.S. military officers were tasked to basically figure out a way to divide the Korean Peninsula because um, the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union, was also a victor in World War II, and it was the beginning of the Cold War. And uh, the U.S. wanted to stem back the um, the tide of communism that had been sweeping the world. And so the um, two state young young officers basically tore a page from the National Geographic, and they drew a line across the 38th parallel. And that is how Korea became divided. Truman, President Truman, sent a memo to Stalin and said, uh, you guys can have north of the 38th parallel, which included Pyongyang, and we will take Seoul and south of the 38th parallel. It was meant to be a temporary division. Um, for three years, there was military governments in both um, South Korea by the US and in the, in the north um, under the Soviets. Um, and then became the creation of two separate states, the Republic of Korea and South, and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea in the North. And then that began a struggle between the two states to unify the country um, under you know, their various systems. And so actually the first, um, allegedly the first skirmish that led across the 38th parallel was on June 25th, 1950. So we're approaching that, this is the 70th anniversary of the start of that war. And so that's what um, historically is considered the beginning of the Korean War. And so it was uh, three years of brutal fighting. As I noted, four million people were killed, mostly Koreans, um, mostly Korean civilians, women, children, elderly. And um, in the North, I mean, we don't hear this, but if you actually look at archives, especially of um, military generals and commanders that testified, in the Congress, you know, they say there are no more targets. You know, we've de we've decimated that country, and so we know that 80% of North Korean cities were bombed to bits. We know that the U.S. committed genocide. We committed war crimes. We totally blew up dams um, that flooded entire tracts of farmland, and so one in four, um, like members of a family were killed in that war. And so if you go to North Korea, you actually talk to the North Korean people, not only do they have that as part of their um, education, you know, they remember the Korean War. It is like not just in their education and the curriculum and passed down from um, generation to generation, but it is all over the billboards. I mean, if anybody has been to Cuba, it's, uh, you know, there are no commercial ads, but there are political billboards all over the country reminding the people about why they have to struggle, why they have to suffer because of U.S. imperialism. And so, you know, we don't get that perspective in this country. We definitely get, um, I think, the perspectives of some defectors that are very anti the regime. And um, I think, you know, absolutely, it's an authoritarian dictatorship. And we hope for a different kind of future for North Korea. But frankly, from our perspective, we don't see regime change ever being a successful thing. Mm -hmm. And what we need to do is help create the conditions in that country for things to improve. And so, for example, the U.S. policy on North Korea is sanctions. 
And so um, it's been under place for a long time, but the shift from the Obama administration to the Trump administration has shifted from what was called smart sanctions that just targeted the arms industry or targeted the regime or luxury goods is now like wholesale impacting the North Korean civilian economy. So I often talk about women and women's empowerment. And I think that's a very popular normalized thing. It's like, oh, when we know that when women have access to resources, everybody benefits, right? Um, but at the same time, now UN Security Council sanctions led by the US block certain industries. So for example, textiles, that was a growing industry for North Korea. 400,000 jobs have basically been lost by these sanctions. And so 400,000 garment workers are without a job. And so 80% of those garment workers are women. They can't export textiles. They can't export fisheries. They can't, they have a cap on how much oil that they can import into the country or export of coal. I mean, yes, I mean, from an environmental perspective, absolutely, we want to support it. But when they are just um, barely eking out a living and to survive, I think that we have to take a global perspective and to look at where do we as Americans have um, culpability and responsibility in this? What was America doing? What was the United States doing? Dividing the Korean Peninsula, waging this war um, that was the Cold War that uh, then, you know, really set forth the um, beginning of endless American wars. And I think that is where we get some interest, I think, from especially uh, people that don't have a clue about Korea is that, um, you know, this is a historic opportunity. The two Koreas do want an end to this war. They have signed in the last two years, Kim Jong-un and Moon Jae-in, the leaders of North and South Korea, have signed two historic declarations um, saying that they're going to transform the Korean Peninsula into a land of peace. And frankly, right now, the key obstacle in that process is the United States. Mm. Yeah, so I guess just the, I guess the lesson I want people to take out of your work and, you know, this history is that America is not in a place to point fingers, you know, and to, and to guide other countries in like how to resolve and really just like to take responsibility for what um, this country has done, you know, to Korea as well as to many other regions across the world in their imperialist foreign policy um, activity, you know, throughout history. So that's something that like I'm really passionate about sharing as a message. And it's not to say any country is perfect in any way, of course, you know, we all have our work to do. But just to understand things like that before we point fingers at a country like North Korea, in which they have this, yeah, authoritative government. But, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, well, they're lying to their people, all this news about America being evil. And when I look at the quote unquote propaganda that's being shared with their population, none of it's untrue. You know, it's all like America waged war on our people and destroyed our land and killed X million people. And so, um, I guess that's something is like this whole concept of propaganda being spread by North Korea, the North Korean government. I kind of wanted to like dispel that myth. That it's not all lies, right? And in fact, if you look at our own media, which is owned by corporations, um, you can probably find more lies in that, I would imagine, than you would find in North Korea's media. I love that about your generation. You guys already have that critical analysis already, you know? And, you know, you mentioned the Samantha B show, um, or I don't know if you did online, but um, it was so fun to be on that show. And, you know, like you uh, do like hours of recording before they do just like that short clip. But um, I, they asked me this question about like, well, you know, isn't Kim just so awful to like, they're so shitty to their people. So it's like, what do you say to that? And I, my response was, um, well, I mean, if you, yes, I mean, you know, if you have the large, world's largest prison population where one in four children go to bed hun hungry, where um, we don't even, you know, have the basics of survival like homes and health care, um, and where we spend more, right, in uh, waging war than we do in, in caring for the well being of its people. And we do mass surveillance of the entire population. You know, it's like, I think we have to ask the very same of our own government. And I think that they were totally tripped up by that. And they were, you know, just expecting that I was talking about North Korea when, in fact, 
um, the United States, we have a lot of work to do. And I think the connection to Korea is that actually by ending this conflict on the Korean Peninsula, which is ripe to be picked and to come to a closure after 70 years of war, that we can do so much to advance our security here at home. Yeah, and really it's like all these, you know, North, South Korea and the United States, like we're all exhausted, wasting all these resources and energy and money and media time, all this stuff in a conflict that doesn't need to continue in this way. So I think in a lot of ways, your work is advocating for the best of all of these countries and hopefully, yeah, reunification is a reality for the future. So we have two minutes left. I just want you to share kind of like, you know, closing messages, like what you really, you know, hope to get out of your work, maybe some future visioning um, for what you, yeah, what you're really trying to do here in the world. Well, one concrete thing I think for the listeners in Hawaii is um, we have introduced a resolution in the U.S. Congress called HRES 152, calling for an end to the Korean War with the peace agreement. And we actually have 41 co-sponsors and Tulsi Gabbard is one of the um, co-sponsors of it. But Ed Case, who is the congressman, who's kind of a Cold War dinosaur, um, has not yet signed on to it. And I think it would be really helpful if all the listeners on this call just, you know, picked up the phone. You can go to koreapeacenow.org. There's some um, fact sheets about how you could make the case. But just say, you know, it would be great for Congressman Case to support this House resolution. We don't want to see experience a false missile alert um, ever again. And the way we could do that is to get to peace with North Korea. And so that would be one concrete thing to do. And I think it would be great for anybody, especially Korean Americans who want to be involved in this movement. But it's um, it's more than just about um, Korean Americans and um, the Korean diaspora that are behind this. It's a very diverse intersectional movement. And so um, we would welcome interns or um, other people that want to get involved. So you can go to the website, womencrossdmz.org and get connected. Yeah, awesome. Well, Women Cross DMZ, Korea Peace Now. Um, Christine, thank you so much for being here. I want to talk to you more about this offline. And thank you for joining me on Think Tech Hawaii. Thank you, Dure. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.